Sixth Meeting, Saturday, June 15th, 1974. Adan Mahabua gave the following talk. In Buddhism, the Lord revealed Tamma in three categories. These are, one, Bariyati, this being the process of learning so as to gain knowledge and understanding in the methods of practice. Two, Patipatti, after studying the way, we turn to do the practices which the Lord taught. Three, Bhartiveta, that knowledge which is the successful result of the practice in which one knows clearly and penetratingly throughout. Unlike nowadays, when monks are taught to pass exams of grade three, grade two, and Bariyan, in the time of the Lord Buddha, the Savakas were not taught a great deal by the Lord. Instead, they learned by practicing meditation. Those who knew that the Bhartika were many, but they got no diploma to boost their vanity, only knowledge and understanding that enabled them to go further and further in the practice. The Lord Buddha taught every Savaka to contemplate hair of the head, Geza, hair of the body, Loma, nails, Naka, teeth, Danta, and skin, the Zho, which are things that we all have in our bodies. But by ourselves, we are incapable of realizing that these things arise and cease continually, always changing in accordance with the truth of what they are. The Lord taught the Savakas about this so that they would know the truth that these parts themselves display. When these things reveal themselves as having an unpleasant, repugnant nature, then discontent arises. But mostly people don't see this, so they grasp hold of the body and consider it to be a treasure that they must adorn, take care of, and look after all the time. The Lord Buddha taught body contemplation so that we should not feel worried and anxious when the body starts to function abnormally and go wrong. Gesa, Loma, Naka, Danda, and Dajo have inherent within them the characteristics of continual change quite regardless of the status of our birth, social level, or skin color. Those who study them will get to know them truly because they are attached to our bodies. Birth, old age, change, and uncertainty cause dukkha and hardship in the hearts of people. For that reason, the Lord Buddha taught every member of the Savaka Sangha the five Gammatana and sent them off to the forest to study Gesa, Loma, Naka, Danda, and the Cho, contemplating them one by one, first in the forward order, Anuloma, and then in the reverse order, Bhatiloma. The Zalvikas went to practice in mountains, caves, and cliffs, wherever it was convenient and peaceful for them to work, taking up these five gamartana as the basis for striving, until clear knowledge arose of both the body and the jitta. Bariyati refers to what we learn from the Lord Buddha that enables us to get rid of stupidity and dullness in regard to those things which we have in our own bodies. Bhatibhati refers to the practice of sitting in samadhi, walking jangama, and investigating the above five things, which are like a grindstone for sharpening wisdom to make it become keen and strong until it comes to know the truth about the body. When wisdom is practiced correctly, skill and cleverness develop in the heart. Even samadhi develops, making the heart calm and cool. These are the results that come from practicing correctly. Bhadeveta refers to clear knowledge that penetrates into all the tamma truths, zatsa tamma, until it reaches limutti, total freedom. All three of these factors are necessary in association with each other, so they cannot be separated out from the beginning of the path to the end. Those who intend to get results from tamma should practice all three without being deficient in any of them. Then the results will be clearly evident and always satisfying. The Tamma that the Lord Buddha taught has not changed from his time right up to the present time. We who practice should understand that this teaching gives us knowledge of how to practice in regard to the body and the citta at times when hatred, desire, anger, and delusion arise. These things are sure to arise countless times in our lives, making us feel agitated and discontented. This happens because we are not circumspect and guarded in relation to the thoughts and imaginings of our minds, so we must learn to know which actions give rise to bad effects and which give rise to beneficial ones. The practice of Buddhism, therefore, is a way of meditation focused on our own minds for the purpose of developing calm and coolness inside. The more we practice Buddhism, the greater the benefits, which is appropriate for a religion that teaches people to be clever in guarding themselves so as to get free from danger. Questions and Answers First Question Man 1 
What you explained yesterday about the jitta being something that does not die leads me to understand that the jitta is the same as the soul. Please, would you elaborate on this point a bit more? Answer. What is the soul? Man 1. The soul is the one that must associate with God. Each person has one soul. When a person dies, the soul waits for God to judge it and is then sent to either heaven or hell. Answer. Jitta, or Mano Vinyarna, is the one who knows. It is also referred to as the heart. As for Vinyarna, the consciousness which comes from the impact of sensation through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, it arises in association with these things and then ceases. This is what is called Vinyarna in the five kantas and is different from the jitta. But Bhartisante Vinyarna, which comes under the first heading above, is the jitta that goes to take birth each time in any one of various possible realms and characteristic forms of existence. The jitta has seeds attached to it. In other words, gamma, which has been done, that can send it off to be born in various different states. In Buddhism, it is explained that beings are born in various different circumstances and states because of Bhartisante Vinyarna, the jitta that has the nature of anitta, dukkha, and anatta. Gamma is the force which drives the jitta on. But when the jitta has been washed clean until it is made pure, Bhartisante, free from gilesas and gamma which would otherwise attach themselves to it, the pure jitta knows within itself that it will not be born again. It knows without a doubt that it is free, that it is finally and absolutely beyond the rule of anitta, dukkha, and anatta. As long as the citta, or bhartisanthu vinyarna, is still not pure in every way, it must live under the rule of anitta, dukkha, and anatta. But this citta is very subtle, so how can it be anatta? It may be illustrated by the following simile, which gives a comparison with emptiness. Suppose that a man is told to go into a room and say whether the room is empty or not. When he sees that there is nothing in the room, he says, This room is empty. But the person who sent him in counters, How can the room be empty when you are standing there in the middle of it? He then becomes aware of himself and leaves the room. Only then is the room truly empty. The jitta which gets rid of atanudirte, belief in self, entirely, has nothing mundane or relative left in it at all. Therefore it is said to be an empty jitta, or a jitta that is pure throughout. Since atta and anatta no longer exist in the jitta, the jitta is absolutely free from conditions of both atta and anatta. Second question, woman one. What is dukkha? Answer. Dukkha exists in all living beings. Speaking from the standpoint of tamma, dukkha is the truth that everyone experiences. But our hearts do not see what the truth is, so we continually negate the true nature of dukkha. The deluded jitta does not know the truth of dukkha, so when we search for a way to cure it, we cannot find a cure for it by ourselves, because we do not know the root cause of dukkha. Then dukkha becomes so much a part of us that we have dukkha all the time, regardless of whether we understand what it is or not. As to your question, what is Dukkha, please examine Dukkha carefully at those times when Dukkha arises in you. Dukkha exists in everybody, without exception, so who better to ask about Dukkha than the one who experiences it? When you practice the way that the Lord Buddha taught, you will come to know these things. Buddhist practice is the only way to understand Dukkha with certainty. Third question, man two. What is intuition? For example, sometimes I have a problem and I cannot think out how to overcome it. Then I go to sleep, and when I wake up, the answer to the problem comes of itself, and it is the right way to overcome it. Answer. This often happens to those who practice, but it's an internal experience, special to each individual, so it would not be right to talk about it to other people. Fourth question, man three. Samsara is knowing, is it not? And anitta, dukkha, and anatta are knowing, so when we dream, it is the knowing itself that does the work. Answer. 
In the circle of those who practice, to say that sansara is knowing is right. When the jitta is no longer deluded, it is this knowing that will be relinquished. But please be careful to use wisdom to contemplate until you are able to understand this clearly. Don't be too easily satisfied with your understanding, because it may lead you to go wrong later on. You must use wisdom here like a knife. You must use all sides of the knife to be effective. You must use the sharp side on yourself to cut out and get rid of your faults, and the back of the blade on other people. People usually use the sharp edge on other people, but when it comes to themselves, they use the handle or the back of the blade. Before you come to know that the jitta is sansara, wisdom will probably have to contemplate external things until it knows them clearly and lets go of them. Then it comes and sees the danger in the true ringleader of sansara, which is the jitta. When you see that the jitta is sansara, it is called seeing in the reverse manner, pradiloma. In other words, turning back inwards to get to know yourself and ending all doubts at the same time. You must contemplate both internally and externally. Externally, there are natural phenomena in the surrounding environment, which are basically composed of earth, water, air, and fire. Internally, there is the area within the jitta. It is there that you should know what you must get rid of. Suppose a drinking glass falls and breaks. You must look and see it as it is. If you imagine that it's someone's fault that it fell and broke, you will be troubled and upset. But when you realize that it went its own way, according to its nature, you free your heart entirely, and there is no need to be upset about it. It is important for the jitta to turn round like this and catch up with the gilesas. Finally, you will know the one who creates imagination, sankara, the one who creates all the stories. When seen with profound wisdom, the stories cease forthwith and no longer follow on from one another, building a series of thoughts branching out wider and wider. Discussing the essence of Tamma today has become more and more interesting for all of us, but there should also be something about practice. What is practice? It is that which brings you good results by letting you know and see fully. When those who practice report to the teacher and tell each other of the results they have attained, they can correct their faults, which gives them clarity and confidence. Each person who practices gains results according to the basic nature, pulmi, of his jitta and his tamma, which differ from person to person. So the teacher has to give explanations continuously to encourage those who practice so that they can strengthen their resolve. He knows the results that he has attained for himself, and those that the pupil has attained by practicing in the same way to be essentially the same. Because the teacher who knows clearly has already gone the whole way, he is able to talk the pupil into penetrating through and letting go of everything, until the pupil also penetrates through and gains freedom. Buddhism is not Mokaraja, a useless kingdom, but it is genuine and true and fully capable of giving release from Dukkha. I would like to explain this to you so that you understand all the reasoning, but I have no way to do so because my command of English is no good, forcing me to speak through a translator. Concerning Vimutti, release or freedom, the Lord Buddha revealed it fully, because the Lord knew it truly and the Sadhaka Arahants also knew it in the same way. They never disputed amongst themselves about it, they all revealed it in just the same way. None of the Arahants have any doubt about it at all, for they have seen that Nibbana Paramang Sulkang. Nibbana is the ultimate happiness. Nibbana Paramang Sunyang. All of us know emptiness, Sunyata, in the way that people in the world generally understand it, meaning that everything has disappeared. It is like this glass tumbler here. If someone takes it, or if it breaks, we are then empty of this glass. This is the way the conventional world, Sammuti, sees it. But emptiness in the manner of Vimutti, as was known by the Lord Buddha and the Sāvaka Arhants, is of a different kind. The ordinary person has never seen the happiness that comes from emptiness. So, in spite of the fact that the Lord Buddha always taught true things, we are bound to be doubtful and deny it. For our hearts, which are still not pure, cannot yet accept it and have not reached an understanding of it. The jitta which is still false is not yet likely to accept true things as its objective support, aramrna. It is like excellent food, well prepared, that drops on the ground. We do not like to eat it. The tamma of the Lord Buddha is pure, but if a person's jitta is dirty, it cannot accept tamma in a good way. 
when the jitta and the tamma are both pure, they blend well together. So none of the arahants had the slightest doubt in regard to the vimutti that the Lord Buddha constantly taught. Fifth question, man four. The belief in self, where does it come from? Answer. It comes from ourselves. Suppose that we go out looking for a horse, and we find a horse, but instead of catching it, we try to retrace its footprints, thinking, it will be a horse that came from there, won't it? What use will this be? Or again, if we go walking and get a thorn stuck in our foot, what should we do? Should we pull the thorn out and put medicine on the wound, or should we investigate to find out what the thorn is, where it comes from, and so on? If we do the latter, the wound may go septic and spread until eventually we may have to have the leg amputated. If we do not want to lose a leg, we should do the former, but if we do not mind, we can do the latter.' 